intended. Mm -hmm. um, hello and welcome to uh, the Quagmire. It's Alan Marsh here and with Harry Thompson. Hello. And today we are hosting Olivia. We are talking about Mormonism. So, Olivia, tell us something about, tell us some more about Mormonism. What is it? Um, okay, so Mormonism is actually just like a nickname that we're trying to, trying to lose. Um, I, I would just describe myself as a Christian or like someone who follows Jesus Christ. The official name of my church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And yeah, it's a, it's a Christian religion that I've been a part of my whole life. In fact, I even served um, as a volunteer for 19 months um, for my church and I really enjoy it and I really love it. And yeah, it's a, it's, you could kind of say it's like a branch of Christianity. It's a different sect of Christianity. Tell us a bit more about your time, your like time there. Tell us a bit more about it. Yeah, so um, I decided I want to volunteer for my church because I, I loved it so much and I wanted to, to um, share it with other people. So I told my church I was willing to be a volunteer and they send you somewhere in the world. It's kind of like a surprise. They pray about it and they send you where they feel that you need to be. Um, I got sent to a really unique mission when I was a missionary. Um, I got sent to the church headquarters actually in Salt Lake City, Utah. It's called Temple Square. And um, out of all the missions in the world, it's the only one with just girls. Um, so it's really, really fun. There was a proper big like sisterhood vibe. You know, we all became such good friends. Um, but yeah, I served for 19 months. Well, actually I only served for 16 months in Temple Square. And because it's the church headquarters, um, they can give you the option if you want to spend three months elsewhere in America to experience like normal missionary work, like typical missionary lifestyle. Um, and so I went to New York City for three months as well doing that. But overall, like it was such a life changing experience. And I learned so much about my relationship with God and how I feel about him and how he feels about, about me. Sorry. Um, and like overall, it's just like the biggest life changing experience I've ever had. And I made so many friends. And I mean, I've been home from my mission about a year and a half, but I still think about it every day. I could talk about it forever, actually. I love it. <laughs> so what would be like a day in the life when you're on the mission? Like how would well, you, how would your day be structured? So we wake up every day really early, um, and we work out for thirty minutes, just doing some yoga or some sort of exercise. We have a really strict schedule actually, um, and then we do some studies for a few hours, and um, we we study from the Bible and another book of scripture, the Book of Mormon. Um, we just study lots about the church. We like pray and. Um, like have any personal questions that we want to ask God and we study about that. We can do some language study as well if we're learning a language. Um, and you always travel in two, so you have a companion, so you can help your companion learn the language as well. And then um, we have breakfast and then we go out into the day and the rest of the day, we're teaching people all around the world online um, about the church and about Jesus Christ and about God and how, you know, we teach them how to pray. We teach them where their local church is. We teach them the doctrine of the church um, and also on Temple Square, you've got to bear in mind, it is a bit different from a normal missionary work, but we give tours as well of the historic buildings and we teach them the history of the church and we link that in with the doctrine as well. And we just do that all day. <laughs> and, you know, we have lunch and dinner as well. And um, it's really fun. Like, oh, so much banter. Like I've never laughed so hard in my life. Do you know what I mean? Like we just have so much fun every day teaching people something that we're really excited about. Um, but yeah, we do some service as well, like helping homeless, helping people around the world who don't have as much as we do. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind oh, of that, a very general overview. Right. Olivia, tell us some Mormon jokes. Tell us some of your top class banter. A Mormon joke? Uh, <laughs> that's a really hard question. Um, <laughs> just let, well, the, let that percolate in the back of your mind for a second i had a question about that that mormon mission like you know how you, you mentioned about the companions where you have yeah. to, like, i'm not sure i could do that because don't you have to like spend all of your time in the in the presence of a companion like you're not really yeah, allowed. You i mean I, I, don't, I think i'd go crazy you know in that in that situation <laughs> i think i need a little bit of time to myself you know <laughs> yeah like you, you might go a little bit crazy <laughs> yeah. um like, yeah, you pretty much have to spend all your time with them, um, apart from obviously like in the bathroom or if you're having like a, a personal conversation with like someone in leadership of the mission or something like that, you know. But other than that, like you spend a lot of time with this one person because you're teaching companions and you help teach together. It's really good, actually. Like at the beginning, it might it might be a bit hard 
to always be with this one person. Um, it does change every few months though, like you, you change companion, you know, people decide who, who you're with. Um, but actually by the end, like you definitely get used to it. In fact, I kind of miss not being with someone all the time now. Like it's the sake of companionship, you know, always having someone there, always having a friend, someone to talk to, someone to rely on. I actually really like it. I mean, do you think that improved your social skills? Like having that companion with you, having to always engage with someone? Do you think that conflict, how do you think that impacted your social skills? Like yeah. yeah, I'd say um, it helps me learn a lot a lot of patience, a lot of charity, you know, there'll be little situations when you're late to like a lesson or something and they're like still putting on their shoes or taking their time. But it's, it's a good thing to like learn charity, learn patience, you know, it's nice to always have a friend. I actually, um, during the course of my 19 month mission, I had 11 different companions um, and they were from all over the world. Collectively, they spoke 16 different languages. And so it's amazing to live with someone from France, from Iceland, from America, Hawaii, Tonga, Spain, like Costa Rica, like all over the world. These, these really beautiful, interesting girls that I can be with and spend my time with. I feel like I've made really good, like lasting friendships. You know, it's really benefited me in my life. Well, let me just say that even as like someone who's like an atheist, like sounds proper, like, that sounds probably dope. Like, I don't, I don't want to do that now. I just want to meet so many different people from so many different countries. Like, and the fact that you found this loophole to, through religion, to like be able to do that is. Yeah. It is amazing. In fact, in my mission, like I said, it's the only one in the world with just girls. And there's around 220 girls, and we all live together in this one little place. Um, but collectively, they speak 44 different languages. And so it's amazing. It feels like I've traveled the whole world just by going to Temple Square, just by living in this one place. I have so many friends from like Thailand and all over Asia, all over from like Polynesia, South America. You know, it's just amazing. I really miss it. Mm -hmm. I've got a question about Mormonism, though. Like, sure. can you um, see the difference between Mormonism and traditional Christianity that you can send into Godhood in a way? Yeah. Or, yeah, tell me more about that. Tell me, like, what, what happens when you ascend into Godhood? Are, are you, do you mean, like, becoming like God? Yeah, becoming part of, like, God or whatever, like... Yeah, well, there are some really interesting differences um, between my type of Christianity towards, like, if you were to compare it towards stereotypical Christianity or mainline Christianity, I could say. There's lots of differences that come along with that. Like, we have another book of scripture, the Book of Mormon. We have modern day prophets. We don't believe in the Godhead, like the Trinity. Um, but yeah, one of the differences is, is that we believe that we have unlimited potential and that we can become like God. And we believe that because we think that we're children of God. We are his sons and daughters. He created our spirits. And just like any child here on earth, they want to, you know, become big and strong like their parents. That's how we believe it as well. If I could like, that's a silly analogy, but that we can become like God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that really does encourage like self-improvement really. Which I do feel like has really like in a missionary, like, you know, in your mission, you kind of improved as a person, you improved socially, you improved with that your patience and in a way like that's an incentive to ascend to the godhoodness, an incentive to be a better person in a way. Yeah, I would say like being a member of this church definitely helps me improve in every single aspect of my life. It makes me want to be physically um, healthier, makes me want to be more like financially aware, makes me want to be more academic, more social in every like form of life. Um, the gospel of Jesus Christ is something that's really helps me and benefited me. And hopefully, you know, I strive to be more like Jesus Christ. I look to him as an example and he's perfect, you know. So I try my best just to be like him. And it's not easy. Like I fail every day. Don't get me wrong. I'm not perfect. But um, he is like the biggest example in my life. That's the purpose of life on earth, to become more like God. That's why we were, that's why God sent us to earth. Um, that, yeah, that's one of the reasons. Because that does confuse me a little bit, like why God would send us to earth. Like why wouldn't God just let us stay in heaven? Mm, yeah. Um, we believe actually in my church that we live in heaven with God before we came to earth, but we all decided to come to earth because we had to gain that experience. We had to experience happiness and sadness, receive physical bodies, have families, 
experience life because that's how we grow you know like difficult times make us grow more um, and coming here to earth like we'll experience lots of different things and we'll be able to make choices and grow as people and so that really helps with the growth process mm-hmm. so, so you're saying what are you saying what are you carrying uh, i was just gonna say like that's with with the layers of heaven so like once the day of judgment happens and everybody gets assigned to a different layer of heaven is it still like you can move up a layer if if you're in hell if you're in the bottom layer you can move up can, uh, so like the ultimate goal is for everyone to end up in like the celestial realm um well yeah that's an interesting point of my doctrine as well actually so as a member of the church we don't really believe in heaven or hell um compared to like other christian religions um and this has always made a lot of sense to me actually because if you think about it as humans we're not just you know that's 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 too simplistic as humans we're very very complex we're not just good or bad black and white do you know what i mean and um, with different shades different layers of goodness morality um, and so you know if you were to live your whole life trying to be as good as you can but you didn't quite make it into heaven oops off to hell you go like that's so unfair you know but we believe that god is really loving really merciful and he wants the best for all of us so he's created these different degrees of glory different shades of heaven and so that's where that idea comes into play that god has created three degrees of glory and um it's up to us like where we go we will go wherever we deserve to go wherever we feel most comfortable with how we've lived our life um and there is actually some form of like moral progression even after death that we can you know still move up and and make our way and there's always a chance to be forgiven um so yeah like god has given us every second chance that that we can have we believe he's just so merciful and he just you know what's the best for us Mm. now speaking of like you know starting like as angels and stuff i've got a question um Mm -hmm. we so um when god sent us down to earth um like correct me if i'm wrong but um is it true that um the good people who thought for jesus became like white people and the people who were neutral were born with black skin is that true or not or false. <laughs> Sorry. Somewhere that um just heard it that um <clears throat> I don't know, like that like racism in the Mormon church, like to clarify on do you know where that myth comes from then if it's false? Yeah, there's there's basically just a lot of false information on the internet. Um, of things that we don't believe and that's one of them like in fact recently just a few weeks ago the prophet of the church and um, the man that speaks in behalf for Jesus Christ right now and um, he's this cute old man he's 96 years old his name's Russell Nelson and he spoke and he said extremely clearly he said everyone who is a member of the church listen carefully to what I'm about to say next God does not love one race more than another and he went on to talk about that very very in detail very heavily and he said any racism needs to be stomped out individually and community like as a church we need to completely like stand with black lives stand with asian lives stand stand with everyone we need to support those who are in oppression Um, and that's actually a topic that we're very strongly like working towards right now to get rid of any racism and within any like doctrine or beliefs or culture Um, We believe that God loves all his children equally, whether you're black, white, straight, gay, girl, boy, anything. God loves all of us. Yes, just because, like, you know, people like, I don't know if they were products of their time or not, but um, people like, people you know, said slavery was a good thing, like a divine right or something. Like, I think... Yeah, Brigham Brigham Young is actually very, um, a misunderstood character, I would describe him as, within the within the um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was the second prophet of the church after Joseph Smith. Um, I actually like worked and lived in his house for nine months for my mission. So I happen to be like an expert on this man. Um, He actually like was was really good with the whole, like because back then like racism and slavery was still a thing. But Brigham Young himself was actually fantastic. In fact, he was the head of Indian affairs for Utah back in that time where there were a lot of Native Americans and he himself was such good friends with them and protected them. He even adopted a lot of the orphan children whose parents were killed. And in fact, when Brigham Young died in 1877, the chief of the like indigenous tribe back then he said now who will be our friend like our greatest ally is gone um, and so Brigham Young actually really stood strong for for um 
you know, equal rights for girls and boys as well, not just for black and white people. In fact, he hired a lot of people to, to work in his home and he made it very clear to his family that they must not be called slaves or um, like house workers or anything that, like that. He made sure that they were a part of the family as well. And so I, I personally feel that Brigham Young is a very just misunderstood character. Don't get me wrong, he's not perfect, you know, no one is. Um, but, but yeah. Yeah, like, because um, it's not like a split in the Mormon church between people who like, like, who think he was a good man and people who think he was bad and stuff, or? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know if there's a split in the church. I mean, everyone has their own opinion. You know, maybe some people just don't really care as well. Or maybe they just don't know a lot about him. But I personally really like Brigham Young. He's one of my favourite prophets that's ever lived. I think he did a lot for the church. And I definitely believe that he was a man um, inspired by God to lead and guide God's children on the earth during that time. Um, I had a question about, um, like you were talking before about your mission and you go over to different parts of the world uh, to, to help people and to understand mm -hmm. the, the, your, your church. Um, mm -hmm. But like there's a lot of people who, like why, for instance, like Jesus was born 2000 years ago and that was the start of Christianity. But before that, there'd already been like billions of people on planet Earth without a savior, you know, like, mm -hmm. so how, how were they supposed to find like the true doctrine or like people, for instance, who are born in, in China, who, who have no, no access to Mormonism, like why would God allow them to be born uh, outside of the influence of the church? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, actually. Um, so in the Old Testament, um, before Jesus Christ was born, prophets for thousands of years have prophesied of a Messiah, of Jesus Christ, someone who's going to come and save the earth by sacrificing himself. It's also recorded in the Book of Mormon. In fact, a large chunk of the Book of Mormon is dedicated towards that. But like you said, even now, there are people who live in countries around the world where Christianity is just practically unheard of. And so it would be really unfair if those people were to live and die and never hear of Jesus Christ or let alone God do you know what I mean but we believe that God is really really merciful and again you know he's going to give us every chance that we can get to accept um, his gospel and so we believe that even in the afterlife those people um, although their bodies have died their spirits live on and they can learn about the gospel and they can still have the ability to choose and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ in fact, we do a lot of um, temple work for those people where we can perform ordinances and promises on their behalf of people that have died. Um, and they can um, choose to, to accept those ordinances or not. Um, yeah. Um, um, it's about, um, about like, um, I'm not even against this concept, but um, you know, like with, um, in like Mormon heaven, like, as it would be, um, let's say um, a man gets like tons of like celestial angels. Does someone get the same, or like of like celestial male angels in heaven? Or I was just wondering. Uh, wait, I don't know if I understand the question. They they get angels, or like um, I thought it was like um, poly there's polyamory in heaven in Mormonism, as far as I polygamy. Polygamy, yeah. Oh, polygamy. Um, yeah, so polygamy actually was something that was practiced in our church um, from the years around eight. I'm just going to guess the year. It's, oh, what year did it start? I can't remember. It was around like 1835-ish. Um, but in 1890, the, the manifesto came out that polygamy was no longer to be practiced. And in 1904, anyone that continued to practice polygamy after that um, was like excommunicated. So it's certainly not allowed today. But I personally believe that polygamy back then, for those 40 years that it was practiced, um, 40, 50 years, it was actually very necessary for the time period. If you look at it like... Um, like some reasons off the top of my head is that a lot of the men back then were persecuted in the church. A lot of them died because the church, you know, almost became extinct in its infancy. And so there were a lot of women back then and, and women back then didn't have a lot of, you know, women's rights. They couldn't earn money or own property. And so um, to financially help the women of the church, 2% of the men were chosen by God to practice polygamy, to help support those, those women, um, I personally believe like it was very necessary for the time, but it's something we definitely do not practice or could like allow today in the church. Because like I'm actually personally against polygamy if it's consent. If like all parties like consent, then 
Oh, yeah. Or harem or whatever. But um, but it would have to be polygamy for everyone. It would have to be polygamy for everyone, like women with multiple husbands yeah. as well. That's what I mean. Polyandry. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got another question. Do you think that also kind of fed into, in a way, a religion is always trying to sell something. They're trying to sell their concept of God. So they're like plague me in heaven that will appeal to a lot of people. Do you think that was in a way a marketing tactic or for the religion of Mormonism? What, p- polygamy? Yeah, because um, if you're a guy, you'll want. A lot of guys want a lot of women, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, <laughs> you're thinking of like the Muslims, where they, you get like 70 virgins or whatever. Is, that's <laughs> Muslim, isn't it? That's not, uh, yeah, that's not the uh, idea sense. I think, um, I think you'd be surprised if you were to ask men, like, oh, do you want a lot of wives? I think a lot of men can't even handle one wife at, at the moment, so I, I, don't, I don't know, you know. Um, I definitely don't think it's a marketing technique, though. Um, if anything is like commanded by god i think it comes straight from him and it's not to benefit the church um in that way but that's a really interesting like theory though like that's that's interesting <laughs> so what i see religions is like they're trying to put across their view and stuff and they have to do it in, in what sells sex sells um like so and what sells money sells like so what they do is they in their conception of heaven they try to promise these material like, you know, these material rewards, because people can visualize them, and they want those material rewards, so mm. they into heaven. Mm. Well, there's, there's a scripture in the Bible, and it says something along the lines of um, what we treasure in our hearts. If our treasure is in heaven, like, it will last forever. But if the things that we really treasure and um prioritize if it's just worldly earthly things that that will rust and you know the moss will eat it and that's going to die one day and so the only things that are really important are the things that that last forever like our relationship with our families um or the knowledge and the education that we have that's what we try to prioritize as members of the church and not so much worldly materialistic things no matter how desirable that is this is something I'm guilty of, by the way. Like, I'm not a perfect person. I feel like a little bit of a hypocrite right now because I just bought myself, you know, lots of nice new clothing and things like that. So I'm not perfect at, at living that, that commandment. <laughs> I, think, I think everyone's guilty of it because... Exactly. <laughs> everyone loves cool shit, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did have a question about um, sexuality in the church because, as I understand it, you're not allowed to masturbate. Um, yeah, so we have we have a commandment called the law of chastity, and um, this commandment encourages us and tells us that we should have no sexual relations before marriage. So that inc- includes like no sex before marriage. Um, it includes like forms of like any any type of pornography or masturbation as well. That's definitely something that we try to stay away from. So yeah. For what reason? Well, we just believe in being like true and faithful um, to to one person throughout our lives and that's the person that we get married to and um, we also believe that masturbation is just not good for us and um, for our for our spiritual welfare it, it damages like pornography I think it's quite I personally am very hot on this topic I follow like a lot of Instagram accounts that are like fight the new drug and um, it just makes us aware of the dangers of pornography of the addiction what it can do to your um, self-esteem how that could damage your relationship with others as well um, yeah, there's there's a lot of reasons, but mostly like it was commanded by God. I was going to sorry. Then you could argue that um, pornography is can be liberating. Like you can use it as a means of like self expression. Like there's stuff like the um, BDSM and stuff, which is used as like a sort of liberating tool. Like stuff that may not be considered like holy or whatever in sex that can be used to really make someone feel better. Like let's say they're under privilege or whatever, let's say they're feeling really down, that sudden release can be really, like, you know, enjoyable. In addition, can you argue that, let's say, the art of masturbation, it can really calm someone. So let's say, um, I don't show it, but I think most people, um, including myself, like, after, after they, they've masturbated or whatever, they feel a lot calmer, they feel a lot better. Yeah, I definitely think it could be um, a form of release and help you to feel, 
you know good and it's, it's kind of what your body is like after um but but we don't really believe that it's like lasting happiness it's a bit temporary um and it can also damage our relationships with with those who we love you know um and it can yeah we it's just something we've been warned of by the prophets to stay away from um because it it's you know it can damage us um the commandments from the prophets that we get we believe that it's from god and because it because god is more um like powerful than us and he he knows more than us he only gives us commandments to keep us safe even when we might not realize at the time why we have them it's kind of like an act of faith like we're gonna we're gonna be obedient and keep this commandment um to the best of our abilities and it's a very normal thing in the world today so not everyone lives it perfectly um it's really understandable people mess up all the time it can be very very addictive um, and so we, we try not to judge those who, you know, do practice those things, even if they are a member or not. Um, if you're in government, would you ban people from doing stuff like masturbation and watching porn? Would you, would you allow it to happen or would you just personally be like, no, I'm not doing it? Would it, is it a personal choice or would you apply it as a political choice? If I was the government? Yeah, if you were, let's say, yeah. Or whatever. Oh, wow, I've never considered that before. If I was, if I had like all that power, yeah. um, I would do what I can with the power that I have to encourage people to follow God. But I think a very, very, very important factor that as members of the church we really hold close to our hearts is the doctrine of having free agency. And so the doctrine of having free will, giving people the ability and the, the choice um, to make decisions. Um, I would encourage people to to stay clean and pure and and to stay away from anything that is addictive or harmful to them, um, like mentally or physically. Um, I, I don't know though. Like I've never considered before, like me being the government and having that that power and that control. I was just wondering because, like, I was thinking about um, you keep saying these things that that you want. Um, so I'm just thinking about how you'd apply it to like the government and stuff. Like also what you said about stuff being. Harmful. Sometimes, like something that's harmful, can be really like good for some people. Like, it's not like one thing is harmful for everyone, and nothing isn't like harmful for everyone. Like, it's like basically that um, some things are harmful for some people, and the same thing isn't for others. Like, some drugs, for example, they may be very harmful for someone's psyche, but for another person's psyche, they can be very good. Mm. Like. A key example is like let's say acid for example some people send them crazy but for other people it can be one of the best experiences it can make you a lot more philosophical so what's your stance on stuff like that that's that's a really good question actually so for example um in my church as members of the church we have a health code that we live by and this health code um it's called the word of wisdom and it encourages us to eat eat fruits vegetables go to bed early exercise blah 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 just really normal things but it also warns us of five things that we should try and stay away from and these five things is alcohol um illegal drugs tobacco tea and coffee and just anything that is harmful or addictive to our bodies and so for example yeah like like what you said um you, you know some people might be able to handle the odd wine you know on the weekend or something like that and they might not become an alcoholic and so for them it would be fine whereas others might become really really um addicted very very fast it would be really harmful to them and so i think perhaps what God has done is he's just set the bar, he set a standard and said, nope, no alcohol at all for anyone. Um, and that's that's what he's given because he just wants to, I guess, edge on the side of caution to keep all his all his children safe. Okay, so he's looking at the most vulnerable common denominator of society. Perhaps, I, I don't know. Like me, for example, I've never tasted alcohol in my life, but maybe if I did, I wouldn't even become addicted, you know? But to be honest, it's not that big of a sacrifice. I've not really had to miss out on a lot. I can still go to parties and things. I just, you know, choose not to drink. And so I think it's really smart of, of, of God to do that. Um, I guess he just wants to really keep all his children safe out of love um, because any parent would want to protect their child and he's a perfect parent, so. Mm. How about people with, like, surely shouldn't we ban like everything because someone will have an allergy to a particular thing like just as someone has an addictive personality someone may have let's say it's like um eggs or whatever people have egg allergies or not people have not as like allergies mm. you ban the consumption yeah 
we encourage not to consume nuts or it's it's not so much about allergies i think also we have to remember god doesn't want to micromanage us and he's given us a brain for a reason just to like think about things and to be smart for example someone might be really really addicted to chocolate i think i'm actually one of those people like I am obsessed with chocolate and I just eat it all the time. And if I became really, really, really addicted to chocolate or to sugar and I just couldn't control it, that's probably not smart. And that's also against God's health code that he's given us just to not, you know, he's just asking us to be generally aware, like be healthy, like try not to be addicted to anything, eat, eat fruits and vegetables, get plenty of sleep and water and things like that. And so he doesn't want to micromanage us. You know, he's given us a brain for a reason to figure out how to how to be healthy i guess it's like i was just saying like the most vulnerable sections of a like, society like from what it sounds to me like god is setting the bar for like the lowest and like the least the most vulnerable really so mm. i'm asking that surely he should ban like everything because not everything but most foods because most foods people can't be allergic to if he wants to really protect the most vulnerable, that was my general like, line of reasoning. Yeah. Again, it's not so much about being allergic to anything or allergies. Um, God wants to give us as much freedom and as much choice as possible. And so he doesn't want to micromanage us. For example, um, there are some members of the church that drink herbal tea because it doesn't have caffeine in it. And so it's not really addictive. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas there are, there are other members like myself uh, um, who don't drink tea at all. And that's fine. It's kind of a personal decision. It's really important to not judge other people um, on what they feel is comfortable because at the end of the day, it's everyone's own personal relationship with God. I guess there's much, not much drama in the missionary like works then if you're not drinking much tea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You just have to make that point, just have to, but... <laughs> how, do you, how do you feel like uh, being a member of the church influences your study of philosophy at uh, university? Yeah, well, I started studying philosophy in A-levels, and I did it for two years, and I remember at the very beginning of my A-levels when I was 16, I remember being a bit scared that one day I would walk into my philosophy class as a Christian, as a member of this church, and one day I'd walk out an atheist, um, actually though by the end of those two years of studying if anything my beliefs became stronger um, and I find that that like I'm only in my second year of studying philosophy now at university but I found that that's the same thing as well the more um, I learn about different philosophers and concepts and theories and enigmas I realize how flawless the gospel of Jesus Christ is and how fantastic it is especially because I try to practice it and live it as fully as I can and I realized that it actually really works. And so it's really interesting, but if anything, it's made my belief stronger. How you come, I mean, because like there's a lot of different religions who have like uh, authentic religious experiences in them. So for instance, there could be someone who was a you know follower of Islam or something who had like a powerful religious experience in the same way that you, uh, I suppose, have, have had. And like, how would you explain the the power of those experiences in those other faiths? Um, I just think they're just as valid as mine, really. They, they probably had a really important, powerful spiritual experience with God. And that's God's way of, you know, showing them love. In certain times in my life, I've had experiences that are really powerful. And I feel that God's answered my prayers and spoken to me. Um, but I don't think that my experiences are any more valuable than anyone else's from any or no religion at all. I mean... I've got questions about your God as well as philosophy. Um, what attributes does your God have? Is your God omnipotent, omniscient, um, omnipresent? Yep, yep, yep. All those things. Um, he's also like a parent. We call him Heavenly Father because he's our father of our spirits. Um, but he lives in heaven. You know, he's heavenly. He's eternal. Um, a difference, I'd say, is that we don't believe he is three people in one. We believe um, that Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost are three separate people, but they are one in purpose and one in unity, um, but they're three distinct people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just kind of like three people hosting a podcast in a way. Yeah, just like us. <laughs> just, yeah. you know, um, I was just about to say though, um, Stanley is the most powerful possible being. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> okay, so... Um, can you do any, can you do everything? 
Um, yeah, I think so. I'd, I'd say so. Okay, so could he theoretically increase his power level? Uh, I don't know. Are you going to ask me if he can make a rock that's too heavy for anyone to lift? <laughs> I don't ask me if he can lift it. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, I don't know that. <laughs> I was going to, what I was going to ask is, um, oh, can he go on? Um, do you think God could theoretically go Super Saiyan then? Like, increase his power level? Because um, if he can, then he's not the most powerful possible being, but if he can't, then he can't do everything. Honestly, I don't know, but I'm going to pray about it, and when I get an answer, I'll tell you. Okay. <laughs> you get an answer to my question. <laughs> okay, but, um, how I think you had some... That's an interesting question. Um, well, well, I've got a list of questions. Uh, so what, what about um, the nature of heaven? So like when, when you go to the highest heaven, the, it's the, called the celestial heaven, isn't it? The celestial one. And it's like, yeah, it's so what would that be like? Because I've heard that it's like total bliss, but it's also like you live with your family. You're reincarnated into a body and you live with your family. And um, I'm ju I just wonder what that would be like. Maybe you could give a little, like a description of what it would be like. I'd, I'd really like to know what it's like as well. I actually have no idea, but I think about this a lot and I really try to, um, you know, envision and to do like research almost and to ask God, what, what would that feel like? Um, it is true that we are with our families, but we're, we're not re reincarnated, we're resurrected. So our bodies that we have here on earth, when we die, our body and our spirit separate. Um, but after a lot of things happen <laughs> there's a point where we will be reunited with our bodies and our bodies and spirit spirits will come back together but the fantastic thing is that all of our bodies will be perfected so and um, if you lost your leg in a war your your leg will be back and um, there will be no cancer no illness and we'll be resurrected into perfect bodies forever and everyone gets this free gift the good the bad and the ugly everyone no matter how you've lived your life here on earth we um We'll get resurrected perfected bodies but the states that we live in that's more up to us and so it's true that in the celestial kingdom we can be with our families forever for eternity and um, and we'll also live with god because that's where god lives and in the presence of god we will experience perfect joy that's everlasting and it's not temporary and it's just going to be the most beautiful like sweet blissful joyful thing ever and I've not died and gone to heaven so I can't tell you exactly what it's like but this is that's what I do know I mean what would you want it like if you had to create an ideal like picture of heaven what would it be like what would it look like hmm it's kind of hard to visualize it but I don't know why in my mind this is just my own like philosophy in my mind when I think of heaven I just imagine lots of happy people and we're all together and there's lots of delicious food that we're eating all the time and there's like a waterfall in the background and like dolphins and just animals and it's very like it's very much with nature beautiful mountains probably some people surfing on the side I don't know this is just what I'm <laughs> envisioning couldn't you achieve the same thing uh, with science? Like, so, like, couldn't you... Have you ever seen Star Trek? Uh, yeah, once or twice when I was little. <laughs> no, it's like, it's like a utopian society in the future and they've got advanced medicine and they all live in harmony and peace and there's no war on Earth and stuff. Like, couldn't you achieve the same thing on Earth with, uh, if you develop the po politics and science to a certain extent? Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm sure you could try. I think the only difference is that here on Earth, we're physically separated from God and satan also has influence over us he can tempt us he can you know influence us to to make bad decisions and things like that so we can try our best i mean in my family in my home with my siblings my parents we really try to make it like a wholesome environment and um, where we will just you know love and respect each other and we definitely don't achieve it <laughs> but you know we can try our best here on earth but i think there is something special about living close to god when you are surrounded by his influence so what you're basically saying is like compared to let's say we created like utopia or paradise like that would be still superficial there wouldn't be that spiritual element you'd still be missing a bit of meaning like abstract concepts such as like you know meaning and true fulfilled happiness are still absent because you can't manufacture those yeah mm -hmm. i mean we can try our best to to practice living heaven here on earth now in fact 
I've got a really good story. This might help you understand. There's this um, like youth camp summer program thing that our church puts on every year. It's really, really good. It really helps like troubled teenagers. And I've done it myself three times. Not that I was particularly troubled, but anyway, um, there's a story of this, this boy, he's only like 15 or 16 and he's really like a naughty kid. He's, he's doing bad things, you know? Um, but his parents want to kind of like help him out. And so they save up money and they put him on this like church Christian camp that we run. Um, and he gets there and after one day he calls his mum and he says I hate it here get me out of here like everyone here listens to music that I don't listen to they wear things I don't wear you know he's just kind of different and he doesn't enjoy it and um, they're having a good wholesome time singing songs I don't know you know but he's just like I want to get back to drugs and um, you know I don't know bad influences and things anyway um, the point of this story is that when we get to heaven um, are we going to be like that boy? Are we going to say, oh, get me out of here. Everyone else is doing things that I don't do. I don't feel comfortable here. And I think the principle that, that God wants us to learn is to practice living heaven here on earth now so that when we get to heaven, we will feel comfortable around God and being in his presence. Surely, um, let's say in heaven, let's say for that guy, um, let's say uh, you, know, you guys listen to like, different music and stuff. Maybe he to also have like, you know, a room or whatever, like a studio or like a concert hall where the type of music he listens to would be like, I don't know, what is your stance on like, music? Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying, by the way, that like listening to a certain type of music makes you a better or worse person. In fact, that's something I really, really like about my church is that there's no one cookie cutter shape way to be. You can come in many different styles. I have friends who wear like the craziest things, but you know, they're a member of, of my church. And I really like that when people are very different and they don't just blend in with like a typical, do you get what I'm saying? When people are just true to themselves and they're authentic. Um, regarding music though, we do actually have a small like guideline on that, that we should try our best to listen to things that are wholesome and uplifting. I personally try not to listen to music with swear words. I know I sound like a 10 year old, but <laughs> um, yeah, like, just just listening to, to good things not just that though as well um but watching movies and reading books and even tv shows that are uplifting to us um i kind of think of it like a diet it's not just food that you put in your body but everything that we intake on our phones on social media the books that we read the music on our itunes it's what we're feeding our brain um and i'm i'm a i'm personally quite cautious and careful about that i'm really particular with what i listen to and what i watch because everything you know would influence you in some way or another and so i choose to be selective and careful about what i watch and read and so forth that what really worries me about heaven because like some of the best films that i've ever seen have like involved violence and, and stuff like that mm -hmm. and also like so and so like i wouldn't be able to watch those in heaven and, and also there's another element of that which is that like all films and all entertainment and books and stuff they always involve some element of conflict you know, mm. like, so like, for instance, if there was a film at the pictures, that was just two hours of like people having a nice picnic and chatting mm. to each other and like braiding each other's hair. I'm not, I don't <laughs> think it would get that many views. You know what I mean? Like you want a little, <laughs> bit of, a little bit of conflict to make things more interesting. You know what I mean? So if we all went to heaven and everything was perfect, do you not feel like it would get a little bit boring? No, I, com I completely agree with you, like 100%. I could have said that myself. In fact, my sister, um, she's a very, very talented filmmaker out in America, and she actually studies at the church's university called Brigham Young University, named after Brigham Young. Um, and because she's a filmmaker out there, she talked to me how it's really interesting as a member of the church, she is asked to, um, like, produce videos and films and things that actually aren't completely wholesome they include bits of violence bits of conflict and i agree like you need some you know good and bad and you can't have light without darkness you, you do need some sort of um do you know what i mean conflict it helps us learn it helps us grow and i'm not saying that we should you know all the time live in like this perfect society pretending that, that nothing's wrong when actually there's lots of things that that are needed to be fixed so so i do completely agree with you on that point yeah like, what I'm trying to say is that um, there's a lot of like music out there, like that may seem very violent and stuff. It may seem extremely like you know, <clears throat> like lots of profanity. Like I mean, I to listen to a lot of it. Like I love, I'm a huge hip hop head. Like I absolutely love people like Eminem, Nas, Lupe Fiasco, like all the greatest, but all the goats and stuff. But um, 
it's just saying that surely if we cut out stuff like hip hop, violent movies, surely we're missing out on a lot of great social commentary. We're missing out on a lot of like great materials. So let's say someone like Nas or whatever who be rapping about um, his life in the projects of New York and stuff mm-hmm. really clever way, even if he does use like profanity and stuff. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, I don't want it to be misunderstood that I think we should only listen to like, I don't know, yeah. Taylor Swift or some sort of country Christian. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm a massive hip hop fan as well. I love Eminem. Um, I love Kanye West. I lived in the projects in New York, in fact, actually, during my mission. So I really understand that the world is not, you know, all rainbows and fairies. And I'm not saying that everyone should, um, you know, cut out all of these things that have a slight, small, do you know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. like, anything I just personally try to to live my life in such a way that when I listen to something it will make me feel good and that it, it will uplift me um I, I something is, as members of the church that we try to to gauge is if we feel the spirit or not so if I watch something and it makes me feel good it makes me feel happy and productive and wholesome and it makes me want to do good and it inspires me that's probably a good thing like you know God wants us to fill our time and fill our minds with watching things that are going to help and benefit others whereas if I watch something that's going to give me nightmares you know like I mean it's fun every now and then on Halloween to watch a horror movie I'm not I'm not condemning those or, or anything like that um but I just try to live my life in such a way that that makes me feel good and makes me productive and a better person yeah I mean that's a good thing for you to do but like I mean I feel it just depends like what makes you do that because some people like let's say at the gym they'll be listening to a strong like violent move, like music and stuff and that'll really pump them up that'll make them do better at the gym and stuff but it depends there's music for each like, yeah. Well. yeah it does depend at the same time though like people might play like loads and loads of video video games and in, in one sense, it can pump them up, make them work out really hard at the gym. But in another sense, it could also perhaps influence them to do bad things. It might um, inspire or, or motivate them to go out and commit violence themselves. You know, you never know like what the effects do to your to your mind. Yeah, because I mean, if you do, if you like, you know, go out and kill people because of video games, like I think you're just stupid. You're just a stupid. <laughs> but um, what about black think- sports? Pardon? What about contact sports, like boxing or rugby or? Marathon? Yeah, I mean, as long as you don't get too like aggressive about it, as long as you know, at the end of the day, you understand it is just a game. I love boxing, mm-hmm. love rugby. I'm all about that. I'm not very good at it myself, but yeah. yeah. I think the moral like principle. Um, God doesn't teach us what to think. He just wants to teach us how to think. So when Jesus Christ came to earth and he says, don't have anger in your heart, I think that's a really good like baseline to go by. I mean, yeah, you can listen and watch things and play loads of, you know, contact like rugby. That's like all rough and tumble, you know, but if you're angry in your heart about it and you actually want to do damage to someone, that's probably not very kind, you know, mm-hmm. but if, if you understand it's just a game and I don't know, Again, God doesn't want to micromanage us. I mean, in a way, like, yeah, they can be even better because you're releasing, like, let's say there's an angle, like, angle level. Like, when you, like, go into, like, a crunch and rugby tackle, then anger and, like, tension is suddenly released. So, like, you could argue that, um, in a way, these violent contact sports are the perfect way for us to be less angry, level, like, overall. Yeah, I mean, there are definitely ways to release anger. It doesn't always have to be, you know, sports and things, although that definitely helps. But, you know, you can do some yoga or painting or, like, play the piano or there's lots of ways to release lots of energies that I think we should strive to look for productive ways and things that will help us and others. Or the harp. Yeah. Or, or playing the harp, yeah. <laughs> I play the harp. I've gotten really rusty at it recently, though. I need to practice more. Um... Can you also harp? Can, I, can you play us some harp? I, it's not with me right now, actually. It's back down home. I'm quarantining at my boyfriend's house right now. But oh, maybe next time. <laughs> maybe next time. But, um, yeah. Hi, I'm, what did you say? I had a question about um, the prophets. You know, yeah, like go- how, because a big thing in your church is that you have living prophets. Yeah, so I was yeah. just wondering how you recognise a prophet. 
Mm, good question yeah so um all throughout the bible we have loads of prophets like moses and noah and abraham the purpose of the prophet is god chooses a man um to speak on his behalf kind of be like a microphone you know um and when jesus christ came to earth he was a prophet as well not only was he the son of god but he you know declared his gospel but after he died we still need to be guided just like the people back then um, and so we still have prophets on the earth today. Um, Joseph Smith, he was the first modern day prophet in 1830, in 1800s in America. Um, and then he died in 1844. Then Brigham Young became the prophet. He died in 1877, so forth and so forth. And um, today, I think there's been I think 17 prophets since that time. Um, and your question as to how do we recognize a prophet? It's the same way that Jesus Christ established when Jesus Christ um, died the most senior apostle, meaning the apostle who's been an apostle for the longest, becomes the next prophet. Um, and so our prophet actually died two years ago. His name was Thomas Monson. It's a really lovely old man and he died. And he also has 12 apostles. And the most senior apostle was Russell Nelson. And so he is now the current prophet. Yeah. But Joseph Smith wasn't anyone's apostle. Like he was just appointed. He was the first prophet. So like could yeah. be prophets that are unaffiliated with the church. Yeah. So back in the Bible and the Old Testament and things like that, there were multiple prophets living on the earth at the same time. I think mostly that's because they didn't have internet back then or radio and, you know, they couldn't get the message out to all the people all around the world. And so God chose and gave lots of different prophets to guide the people in those geographical areas. Um, but today we only have one prophet. And you're right, Joseph Smith, he was the first modern day prophet. And um, this is because we believe that in our church, Jesus Christ came and established his gospel. But after a while, after he died and the apostles, the gospel and the church that he established was gone and it was changed. And so the true church wasn't on the earth for a long, long time. We call this the apostasy and it means like a spiritual darkness. And there was still, you know, some aspects of the truth in some churches, lots of religions hold lots of parts of the truth, but the fullness of the gospel, the truthfulness of it had to be restored and brought back to earth. And that was done in 1830 um, by Jesus Christ himself. He came to Joseph Smith and told him to help him restore the church. And so although Joseph Smith never came from a line of apostles, Jesus Christ himself, in fact, came to Joseph Smith and said, you're going to be the first prophet back on the earth since, I don't know, you know, Paul or Peter and, you know, Jesus Christ, something around then. So what do you mean? Possible? Oh, sorry. I was about to say, why did they pick him? Why, why did they pick him? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure, but I do like to think about this a lot because if I was Jesus Christ and my church had, be, had been gone from the earth for around 2,000 years and I had to choose someone to restore it, I would have chosen someone like, really important or someone I really trusted like my mom or like I don't know you know like um the the president of a really important nation or something like that but Jesus Christ chose a 14 year old farm boy who didn't have many much schooling was really like dumb and like illiterate do you know what I mean he, he didn't know much he's just a 14 year old farm boy and um, I think that's perhaps because he was really humble and willing to learn it's kind of hard to fill a bucket that's already full but Joseph Smith was like an empty bucket, you know, willing to, to do the Lord's will. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, that's kind of like, um, it, actually in the US, um, George Washington wasn't necessarily the most competent leader, but he was by far the most principled, and that's why they made him their mm -hmm. first leader. I think God has a pattern of using really humble, simple men, like raw materials, and shaping them and refining them to become great leaders. And I think that's something that happened with Joseph Smith, with Brigham Young, certainly as well. He was in a similar position, only had 11 days of formal schooling in his life. He was just a carpenter, didn't know much. And um, lots of prophets and apostles and church leaders have come from really, really humble backgrounds. God doesn't care about their financial situation or their race or where they're from. He just chooses people that are really faithful and willing to do his will. Why does it have to be men? To be a church leader. Just to be a prophet, a church leader, anything like that? Mm, it's because it's a priesthood duty. The word priesthood means like the power of God. And so in God's church, men and women have different duties, different powers, things like that. 
And there are just some things that women are specifically chosen to do that they're more suited towards. And then there are some things that men are chosen to do. And that just happens to be one of them because it's a priesthood calling, a priesthood duty. And you need the priesthood power to, to be a prophet or apostle or a bishop even. But there are certainly callings in the church that only some women can have, like only women can have that men can't. Yeah. Like what? Like being a Relief Society president or a primary teacher, um, young women's leader, obviously, for the young women's, and then there's a young men's leader for the young men, things like that. It does seem strange to me that God is a man, because surely it would make more sense for um, God to be a woman. Like, I, I, don't understand the, I don't understand why, because God, he has complete control over himself. And so does he choose to be a man and he could be a woman? Or is it like his nature is to be a man and he can't, it's not, not something he can change? Um, we believe that, that God is a man and that's just how he is. But we actually believe that he has a wife and we call her Heavenly Mother. Um, and so, yeah, like God is Heavenly Father, but there's definitely a Heavenly Mother out there and they are both our Heavenly Parents. And she's not spoken about as much, I'd say, in our church or in Christianity in general. I'm not really sure if other Christians believe in her. Um, just out of respect of her character, we, we kind of just don't want her to be like, mocked or ridiculed in any way because it's just so sacred you know um but yeah like would you tell us heavenly about mother. the heavenly mother because i've never heard that before like uh, that heavenly mother thing would you tell us a bit about that yeah I don't, I don't know much about it myself to be honest personally like i said it's not really spoken about as much but the amazing thing is is that both heavenly mother and heavenly father they kind of set an example for us of how we are to be i mean we're their children you know they created our spirits you me every man woman and child we are like we're their children and um, and they just have this like perfect love for us they are this like un united companionship and they care for us and um like they're aware of us and our lives and our problems right now and they work as a team um but I will admit, like, we do mostly just focus and pray and talk to Heavenly Father because, you know, he's, he's God. Yeah. Question. Mm -hmm. um, if God is supposed to be, like, sort of a representation of, of a soul, if he's supposed to be this universal, like, being, would it make sense for God to be intersex rather than a man or a woman? Mm. I think that kind of comes back to, um, like, Heavenly Mother. In fact, um, so you know like the islamic word allah and mm -hmm. um, so some like the history of like the def like the like the roots of that word that allah comes from elo um which is elohim and in hebrew it's actually plural meaning two so it's kind of like we're talking about two people two heavenly parents heavenly mother and heavenly father and i don't think that they are you know one person i don't think that they're unisex i don't think that they're, they're combined but they are very much unified um, mm -hmm. and so if that kind of answers your question it's kind of like when i think of my parents i don't just think of my mom i don't just think of my dad like there's both of them they are a companionship together and so god in some way is you know a unifying power of both heavenly mother and heavenly father if that makes sense okay yeah like so, um, I understand you actually, like, so it's kind of like more like two parents, like two parents really, like, yeah. like a unified God, then it would make sense for God to be like intersex. But um, I've got another question. Um, what is like the Mormon stance on, like, what's your like stance on homosexuality? Mm, yeah, really good question. Um, I'm just going to throw a disclaimer out there, by the way, like every question that I answer, like I don't know everything. I'm not a perfect member of the church, but I will try my best to like answer your questions. Um, but yeah, homosexuality. Um, it's something that um, has, has been spoken about a lot by prophets and apostles, especially recently, actually. Um, it's something that we don't practice as members of the church. We're like asked and commanded not to um, practice homosexual behavior, but it's not a sin to be born that way we don't think any less of you and it's okay if you choose a different path in life you know and um, it's really difficult because it's a really important thing about someone you know if they're born bisexual or gay or or anything like that like we have to love and respect everyone equally because again god loves all of his children equally um yeah 
last say that um, surely it makes more sense to have homicide. Like, I mean, you may not personally practice it, but um, it makes sense for it to be like, you know, considered not just to be okay, but to be like pretty good. Like, because if you actually look at societies and stuff, if you look at um, not just humans, but um, all the other, like, other sorts of like pack animals, like, like animals that live in herds or whatever, societies with a combination of heterosexual and homosexuals always tend to survive more because mm. what um, when they're the burden, both of them kind of walk off each other in tandem like for example in penguins and like certain apes um, and like lions I think um, I think yeah in humans as well like in early humans like for example in that Neanderthal societies the purely heterosexual populations actually died out and and also like <clears throat> kids are more likely let's say when there's a lack of lgbt people in a certain population like the genes are made so that there's more likely to be an lgbt birth. like so yeah you know, surely it's completely natural then yeah i mean to be honest like i didn't make the rules you know god did um, and these are just like his commandments that I try my best to to live and to keep. I understand what you mean, though, especially when you look at it from a perspective of like speciesism, how, you know, it, it is normal, it is natural. Um, it's something that I don't even understand fully myself completely. I mean, I don't understand God and why he does everything completely. But my favorite scripture out of everything that I've ever read is a scripture in the Book of Mormon. And it's um, in First Nephi, chapter 11, verse 17. And it says, I don't know everything, but I do know that God loves his children. And the reason why that's my favorite scripture is because I don't know loads of things about the church, about God, about why he commands certain things, certain way. But I definitely, definitely, certainly do know that God loves all his children perfectly. And so when he gives us a commandment, we might not understand why that commandment's there or how it will protect us. But I do know that it's out of love. And if God really is a perfect, loving father in heaven, this commandment that he's given us to not practice homosexual behavior is only there to help us and benefit us. I mean, I was just saying that um, when I actually observe the world, like, I'm trying to take away all my like, personal feelings, thoughts, and just come from a completely just observational place. Yeah. Like, Surely it's more like actually is a good thing to be like, you know, homosexual because the way the world actually works, the way people are, the way that, like, you know, any sort of like, you know, societal animal exists, there needs to be a homosexual population overall. Like it makes more sense. So it makes more sense for homosexuality not like not to be seen. Like I'm just um, observing from just how the world works in general. Like, yeah. so that would make more sense. Yeah, and it's it's something um, like, well, we actually have this document in my church. It's called the Family Proclamation to the World, and it was given in 1995 in Salt Lake City. And it talks a lot about this. It talks a lot about the family and um, kind of the standard of the family and how it should be within our societies and how it should include lots of love, respect, and how it should be um, a marriage ordained of a, a, a woman and a man. Um, and that can be like a hard pill to swallow, you know, especially in today's society, in today's world and the mindset that we have in things can be really difficult to understand why that is God's way. Um, I, I can see the benefits of it in my life and how um, it's, it's worked and how I have an example of both a mother and a father who love me. Um, and I'm not saying that can't be the, the case for homosexual um, couples. Um, I have a lot of friends who are gay or bisexual and things. And I think it's just really important at the end of the day, not to judge people on their actions. If they want to live their life like that, that's totally fine. And I will be their best friend, you know, I'll support them in how they live their life and love them unconditionally. But it's just something I choose my best to live by. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like you wouldn't be, um, well, I'm thinking you can't live by it because you are straight or... Yeah. Yeah, like, I mean... I happen to, like, be attracted to men anyway, but, um, I mean, that's just me. <laughs> I mean, if he wants straight, like, would you live by it, or...? Um, hmm. <laughs> I've never considered that before. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd like to think that I'd try my best. Um, it's quite difficult, though, probably. 
So I'm not trying to take you into a corner. I'm just like, asking questions. Yeah. yeah, no, no, no. I completely understand. I've never considered it. Um, I, I'd like to think that I'd, I'd try my best to live God's commandments. Um, I'd, I'd like to think I'd try my best, but I don't know. <laughs> that does open up a question about biology in that, like, for instance, the, there's certain people, like there was a guy in America who like killed a bunch of people from like a clock tower with a sniper rifle. And it turned out he had like a tumor in his brain that was pressing on his amygdala and like causing mm-hmm. him to have like these huge levels of aggression. And I think there's also instances of like pedophiles where they have like brain tumors and stuff that, that warp their um, desires and stuff. So mm. if you did have some kind of tumor that was causing you to have like attraction towards kids or huge violent thoughts, like how could you be then blamed for your actions if you then went on to do to sin? You know what I mean? Yeah. Wow. That's a really fantastic question. Um, there is an answer actually to this in our church and that is along the lines of that God judges us perfectly according to our thoughts, our intentions, our biology, our childhood, our upbringing. So if that man who killed the, you know, all the people with the sniper and he had that tumor in his brain, God is well aware of that little tumor and what that's done. And God knows that man's heart. And if that's something he really wanted, or if that, you know, irregardless of the tumor, um, God knows his heart and his intentions. This is actually also comes in very handy when you think about mental health, people who commit suicide, actually, that's really horrid to say that that's a sin because they've suffered for years with this horrific mental health issue. And so God is aware of them and that, and that issue that they have. And um, basically the, the answer is, is that we can't judge people perfectly because we're not perfect and we have limited understanding in our human brains, but God knows us, you know, since before we were born, he knows our thoughts, our intentions, and it's all about the state of our hearts. Um, and so luckily, like God is the judge of those things and he has a perfect understanding. Does that make sense? Did I explain that very well? Uh, and that does open up another problem as in like when you say heart, you mean like soul, don't you? Like your, you don't mean like the physical heart, you mean like the soul. And yeah, like your intentions and what you want for people and like your moralness, I guess. But that would be something other than like brain states. That, that, that's like a soul in the body i was just wondering the question would be like what's the nature of the soul you know like what is Mm. this soul that that goes to heaven or that has these intentions well yeah yeah okay i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure on the difference between the spirit and a soul but i do know that that when we die Mm. like our bodies separate from spirit slash soul I'm not sure if they're the same thing. I think they might be, maybe not. <laughs> um, but that is a thing that holds our personality, our knowledge, our intelligence, our intentions, um, who we are as people. And that is the thing that, that God judges and he looks upon. And that's who we really, really are. There's a quote in our church and it's something along the lines of, um, we're not human beings having spiritual experiences. We're a spiritual being having a human experience. And I think that's very, very true. So do you have any theory as to what that spirit might be? Um, in terms of what, like what it, what it looks like? Or... Well, just because no, one, no one's like found it scientifically, you know, you know what I mean? Like nobody's like, you, you can't like get a, like a spoonful of it or, or something like that. I was just wondering like what, um, what, what, what you might think that spirit to be, like what, what it might yeah. be. Um, I'm seeing this actually for my A-levels and there's that case study of that man and he he measures six people and the moment of death they lose on average 21 grams and so he came up with the theory that the soul weighs 21 grams and I've always found that really interesting I don't know if it's true or not interestingly I don't mean to get too philosophical but in our church we believe that everything is physical everything mm-hmm. so even our soul holds some sort of I don't know if it's atoms or what, but it is physical and we might not be able to see it or experiment with it or prod it or, you know, get a spoonful of it, like you said, but it is somewhat physical. Um, I really don't know like what exactly happens. Like as we die, I have my own personal theories that maybe the soul is in our brain and gets released when we die. I don't know. Um, so you think something I find that they will find it with science? You think that we just need to develop our science a bit more? I personally think that God won't let that happen. I could be wrong. This is just my own like thoughts, theories and doctrines. But um, I've always thought that God probably wouldn't let mankind get in the way of his like divine nature, especially when it comes to like the tempering 
tampering with souls, something that is so sacred, you know? I don't think it's possible to do like a soul transplant or, do you know what I mean? I mean, that, that does open up the possibility. I mean, like my, my imagination for like plot lines for like stories is going crazy here, like some kind of mad <laughs> scientist like, gaining access to the soul and like doing like necromancy yeah. and stuff, you know? Yeah, I've always wondered that, like what if God has hidden the soul in the brain and then what if brain transplants become a thing? I mean, it's not yet become a thing. They try to do head transplants, but it's never worked. And I always think as well, like if I was God and I had to hide the, the soul somewhere, you know, where, where would I put it? Lots of philosophers believe that it's out up in the universe and it's connected with our bodies, but it's not in our bodies. Some people think that it is in our bodies, but if I cut off my leg, does that mean like a third of my soul is gone? I don't think so, you know? And so if I was God and I had to hide the soul somewhere, I'd personally put it in the brain. But... I don't know if that's where it actually is. That's just my own theories. Could be completely wrong. I probably am. I just put it somewhere that can't, isn't prone to getting injured a lot. Like, just, yeah. you know, like, I mean, I've got, um, got a question about um, your conception of the, like, the soul. Surely would it be better to actually, like, you know, not necessarily tamper with it because God's not allowed, but surely look up what the soul is really. In addition, um, with people losing 21 grams when they die, um, it's not because um, you're actually, you know, um, defecate. Like, once, like once you die, um, you release what's like in your bowels, surely that's yeah. the um, grams you lose. There's lots of um, like faults and flaws with that case study because he actually only did it on six people and four of them lost weight and on average it was 21 grams um, and so like that theory probably that case study is probably not even super accurate because it is true that people humans release gases and things at the moment of death um, so yeah it's yeah. just one of those things that we don't know and I don't think we necessarily need to know right now here on earth I'm sure when we die and we're with God we can ask him all these amazing questions like how old he is and you know I've always thought like where did Corona really come from? Like, I'm going to ask him one of those. I don't know. Can ask him loads of things when we're with him, and that will be one of them. How old he is? How old God is? Yeah, I remember asking that to my mum when I was like seven. And she was like, "Oh, I have no idea." And in that moment, I knew I needed to study philosophy. <laughs> but you think that God has an age? Like God was born? I don't know. I don't know. Wow. So was something I'm going to ask him. <laughs> uh, same, right, right. Maybe he has a birthday. I mean, um, speaking of ages and stuff, like, how about the Mormon, like, when did they think the Earth was created? Um, like a long, long time ago. We don't believe that Satan planted dinosaur bones or anything like that. Like, no. it's very much in line with science. In fact, I, did, I think science and religion are very much married together. Mm. Me and my brother, we love, um, yeah, we love, like, physics and and things like that, and we yeah. believe that Earth is super, super old. <laughs> like, a few billions, like a few billion years old, like, um, like kind of like um, the modern day conception of the Earth, like with evolution, the different eras, like, is that kind of what you go on with? Or? Um, I do believe that Earth is like billions of years old, but I also believe in the story of Adam and Eve, and when God said he made the Earth in like six days, but I don't think days for him are the same as days for us it could be like a billion years of one day for him do you know what i mean that's the problem with omnipotence um surely it wouldn't take so long to make an earth if you're omnipotent maybe he just wanted to spend his time on it um I'm sure he could have done it faster if he wanted to he definitely could have because that's what you're saying how i'm oh, sorry i'll let you finish i, I was in Robin. no i'm sorry like i just had like you know because I was just thinking that um, if you want to create an Earth, you don't have to spend time on it, on it if you're omnipotent. You do it and omniscient. You already have the perfect formula. Yeah, I'm sure he could click his fingers and, and just created the Earth. Exactly. Um, but I think maybe he just wanted to spend time on it. Maybe it became more like valuable to him. You know, when you work on something rather than just finding it and the thing that you've worked on becomes more valuable to you. Maybe that was the case. Maybe he just wanted to really put time and effort into doing it the hard way and making it himself. Maybe not. I could be wrong. So I just find it quite confusing that an omnipotent God would do that. Take the hard way round. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and he could. Um, I mean, that's another thing. Like, would God really find much meaning in that? Because when he becomes so powerful, he kind of becomes detached from all meaning. 
you probably like you kind of think I think that's a problem in like you know not to straight off top, like topic but um in watch in like Watchmen when Doctor Manhattan basically becomes all powerful he just becomes completely neutral and just not observing he doesn't like care about anything anymore like it just becomes so could you not say say that could happen to God yeah possibly I mean I don't know why he chose to spend his time on it but that's the only thing I can come up with maybe it made it more valuable to him again this is I don't know it's one of those things that you can ask him when we die and we meet him <laughs> I have a lot of questions for him when I get up there so do I trust me I've got a list <laughs> yeah I'm gonna take a break this time if he, if he does exist like he's gonna be like um fuck off at him <laughs> um, but you said you had a question I was just going to mention about you said about evolution like uh, you said that you believe in evolution but how do you reconcile that with Adam and Eve I don't know if I necessarily personally believe in evolution I think there is definitely like forms of it for example like in general the past few hundred years humans have become less hairy because we don't need you know, like that much hair on our bodies because we've got clothing and things now and stuff like that. So there's definitely forms of it that exist. I'm not completely sure that we came from monkeys though, um, or apes. Um, yeah. What about the um, the archaeological evidence with the bones and stuff? Uh... Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe that coincides with with in, there's a theory out there that helps marry together Adam and Eve with evolution, as in like ape evolution. Maybe I'm just not aware of, and maybe I'd agree with that. Um, but currently, I just kind of stick to the Bible in, in what God says. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. I was just saying that, um, surely you could maybe argue that Adam and Eve are you know, different beings who are maybe, um, I don't know, I'm trying to come up with my own theory to justify your seemingly contradictory like, you know, position. So I'm just saying, surely maybe Adam and Eve, like, they existed in heaven, but then they were sent down when, you know, when humans started to, like, you know, evolve, I don't know. Yeah. Kind of yeah, perhaps. What Plato would describe as the form of a human. Yeah. Yeah, you could be absolutely right. Maybe even, like, if apes were a thing and they, you know, evolved really, really human-like, and then the first girl and boy ape that was super, super human, and then they were Adam and Eve. I mean, I don't know, you know, but then that would suggest that God is an ape and I don't think that's the case. So mm. I, I, you know, I, I'm just making up stuff on the spot, but. <laughs> about animals, uh, do animals have souls? I don't know, but I really think about this a lot as well. In fact, I have a friend um, in Manchester and he studies theology um, and he's like a third year student or something like that. And we talk about this all the time. And mm -hmm. um, he has his own theory, how the difference between humans and animals is, um, they both have bodies, they both have the breath of life, whatever that is, and then they only humans have like spirits and souls. And um, yeah, I don't know, because there are examples of animals being really, really compassionate and caring towards other animals and saving their lives. And I think animals do go to heaven as well, but I don't think they have this, the same um, like salvation that we have. I don't think that they're necessarily children of God. Mm. Yeah. Animals, though. What about what, sorry? Um, Elephants. Um, yeah, they're very, they're extremely, like, emotionally, like, intelligent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so are dogs, you know, like, and, and chicks and things. You can see them being really compassionate and empathetic towards other animals. And they probably, you know, they probably have some sort of spirit and soul, and they definitely go to heaven when they die. But um, I don't think that they're children of God, necessarily. What do you mean by a child of God? Um, I mean, like spirit that that god and heavenly mother have created and we are like their spiritual children like spiritual dna almost mm -hmm. you know how like my parents created me they created my physical body they're the parents of my physical body but um god is the parent of my spiritual body mm -hmm. my spirit so. and that makes me his daughter um if, the, if he's an omni god surely all the spirit all the DNA, all the spiritual DNA is his then, is a, a product of his, if he's all-encompassing. Yeah, um, I don't know. Maybe animals don't have spirits then. Maybe they just have souls. Maybe there's a difference. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. But I'm just saying that um, with a lot of animals, like, 
especially like do you not think any other species or animal could evolve to become like a human like just to have the attributes of a human then um yeah I, i don't know i'm sure like animals definitely have um some attributes that are quite human like i mean you you see videos of like monkeys and stuff learning sign language and they're really advanced you know my brother posted a, a video on instagram the other day of this monkey using instagram he was looking at other monkey videos and it was amazing i was like that's so cool um so yeah i think there definitely are a lot of like similarities between the two but also like quite a lot of important differences i think, think as well because um i heard a theory about um no but you know like it's a dinosaur like a dinosaur theory like you know trodon you know like the really intelligent dinosaur there's theory that um if it had survived like the big meteor and stuff that they could have theoretically become like reptilian humans so mm. you know, they could have been children of god yeah don't mm. know that's mm. really interesting i'd love to read that yeah it's just saying they could be like you know they're different to humans they're different to what would be a child of god but yeah they still would possess all the qualities of humans yeah Yeah. It's kind of the question of like what does it mean to be a child of God? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, do you have any more questions Harry or not? Um, no, I think I think I might have got through most of mine. Yeah, I think this is a good place to um you say this is a good place to wrap it up then. Sounds good. Yeah. So um thank you for um <clears throat> thank you for being on the show with you. Thank you. Thank you both for your questions. I feel like um I don't know, you answered really great questions that were quite important and probably helped a lot of people like clear up any misunderstandings or things about Five church. people that listen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so cool. Probably more people get to hear the word of the word of God. <laughs> exactly. Right.